How do you go from being a jungle girl with Bamba to getting a Golden Globe for the high and the mighty and being under a personal contract to Duke John Wayne? We're going to find out today because our guest is Karen Sharp Kramer. Please give her a big hand. <laughs> How are you? Great audience. You have a great audience. Well, I happen to have <laughs> oh my God, the Golden that. Globe <laughs> for the high and the mighty, the most promising newcomer of the year. One of the very few non-Westerns that Duke made. Well, he did a couple. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, you were in another Bat Jet production. Yes. Mm -hmm. A man in the vault with uh, William <laughs> Campbell, which had Paul Fix and all the uh, regular uh, people that Duke used. And didn't Andy McLaughlin direct that? Yes, he did. And he was the son of Victor McLaughlin, mm -hmm. one of the other members of that stock company. And uh, Andy McLaughlin was the AD on The High and the Mighty. Mm -hmm. And it was a fluke how I got that role. I had done Bamba and the Jungle Girl, that is true. <laughs> I, love, I love the Bamba <laughs> movies. I want to tell you a little story about that. And that is one night I was sitting next to Walter Mirisch. You know who Walter Mirisch is. He's a great producer, very famous. West Side Story, all these major. The Great Escape, The Magnificent Seven. Great movies. And I'm sitting next to him one night at dinner, at a dinner party, and he said, Karen, what was your first movie? I said, oh, The High and the Mighty. And he said, oh, well, uh, well, what about Bamba and the Jungle Girl? <laughs> and I said, oh, my God. Well, yes, I did make that movie. I, I, I said, but, Walter, how would you know that? And he said, I produced it. Don't you remember? <laughs> so a few years go by, and I had the idea to do Aladdin. <laughs> Hello. It's, I didn't do it, obviously, but somebody else did. And I went to see him in his office at Universal. And I'm walking down this long hallway with all these great poster boards, beautifully framed, of all of his major films. So I get up to his office and I say, hi, Walter. I want to ask you something. Where is the poster beautifully displayed of Bamba and the Jungle Girl? I don't see it among all your other films. And he said, well, I just can't find a poster board of it. I said, well, I've got two, so I'll give you one. But the next time I come here, I better see it displayed just as beautifully as West Side Story, since you're so terribly <laughs> fond of it. So that's my Walter Muir story, and that's that Bomb on the Jungle Girl. But anyway, um, The High and the Mighty was just such a lucky break for me because, you know, in those days, if you were in a film such as that, with all the Academy Award nominations, and you were introduced as a young newcomer into the industry with John Wayne behind you, I mean, it just assured you of actually having a career. Not so today, however. But what happened on that was uh, I had a great agent. He only had 10 clients. His name was Leon Lance. James Arness was a client just before me. So I had to wait my turn until he could get James Arness started, his career started. James was in a film, so he figured it was time to work with Karen Sharp now. So he took me to Bat Jack, this little house off the Sunset Boulevard, which was Bat Jack. And they were hiring actors for a film called The High and the Mighty. I knew nothing about it, but Andy McLaughlin was in the office that day. And uh, William Wellman was the director. He was not there. But Andy said, you know, you would be just great with this one part of Nell Buck. I'm the assistant a, a director, but I'm going to give you the sides. I want you to show up tomorrow morning at Warner's at 7 o'clock in the morning to test for this role. I said, great, you know. So I took the sides, and I thought, <laughs> read it, and I thought, wow, God, what am I going to wear? So I went out shopping. Like all women, I went out shopping to look for the outfit I was going to wear for the screen test. Well, Mr. Wellman came back to the studio and said, what do you mean you're going to test this girl? I never met her. He said, you get on the phone right now and you just tell her, sorry, don't show up. So Andy 
tried to reach me. Well, we didn't have message services in those days, you know? And if I wasn't home, I wasn't home. So I wasn't home, and he could never reach me. You were showing up early for the test? Well, that was that, was that night. He, 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 he called, but he couldn't leave a message for me because we didn't have any message machines in those days. So the next morning, I'm always early for my call. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be there. So I arrived before 7 o'clock. Well, it would have it that John Smith was supposed to be testing with another girl. There were 10 tests, and I think his, his scene was eight. He was the eight in line with his leading lady who pulled out of the deal that morning. So he had no one to test with. But I was there not knowing I wasn't supposed to test. So I thought, oh, good, we'll put him with this girl, this girl, whatever her name is. And so I thought it was just supposed to be that way. I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be there at all. Nobody told me that until afterwards. Anyway, we get in front of Bill Wellman the director, who was a very famous, well-known director. And he just talked to us a little bit and just wanted to put the first rehearsal on film. So I said, hello, Mr. Smith. Nice to meet you, John Smith. And then we played this love scene. When he said cut, he said, where have you been? <laughs> you are my Nell Buck, and you, you can play Milo. But he said, you are my Nell Buck. And we had that job before we left the studio that day. I don't know what they did with the other two tests that were to come after us, but I got that job with John Smith, who I just had just met. It was a very heady experience for me because there was some, everybody was a star in that film. Dan Sterling, Claire Trevor, uh, Robert Newton, Robert Stack, you know, William Campbell, who I'd already made a little film with, so I knew him. <laughs> and then when we were making the film, the Duke would come down and um, stand right next to the camera to watch us perform, you know. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of scary because Mr. Wellman was pretty scary too, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but it was like he was grinning all the time. He was so proud of us. And, of course, they gave us a great send-off. We were introduced in the film. And uh, the film had so many nominations. It is a great film. And, um, and I was very lucky that I was chosen to be nominated for this Golden Globe here. And I was against Kim Novak, who was starting her career, and it was in films, and, and Shirley MacLaine. But I won it. Well, they did all right. They didn't need me. I mean, Kim Novak and Shirley MacLaine are certainly wonderful stars. They did really great. And then there was the makeup artist ball that, they, they don't have that anymore, but they used to for all newcomers in the industry. And I know Kim Novak was there representing Columbia Pictures. I was there representing Bat Jack. Uh, and these beautiful gowns we were to wear. Well, Mr. Wayne knew I didn't have that kind of money for those kinds of gowns, and he really wasn't a studio. So he took me to Amelia Gray, which was on Robertson, no, Rodeo Boulevard. She was the real deal of the best clothes in town, you know and bought me the most beautiful ball gown. So I would be at my best for that, which I got that award too. Were you already my... under contract to Bat I was, I, I guess because I won the Golden Globe, he, he, he put me under contract to him. Now, Andy McLaughlin, who really wanted to be a director, who was the AD on, on uh, Behind the Mighty, and I can only thank Andy, Mr. Wellman, and Mr. Wayne for this award. The very first thing he ever directed was called Man in the Vault with William Campbell and all the, the actors had to work with Wayne for many, many years where Paul Fix and all these wonderful actors were in that film. Good little movie. I, I'm very proud of that little movie. Um, but I went to Mr. Wayne and I said, look, I need to talk to you about something. I love being under contract to you. This is really a great honor. But let's get real. I'm too young to play opposite you. And all the studios had their contract players. And, and if you, you can't loan me out because they already have young people like me at every studio. So I know this is not a traditional thing to do, and it's sometimes looked upon as not the right thing to do. But I want to go to television. Would you allow me to do that? And he said, absolutely. I said, because I want to do live 
television when it was live live. But it was live live in the playoffs 90s, the Hallmark Hall of Fame. So, so he allowed me and said, go right to it. And, um, and so I think that's really why I had so much television, because he allowed me to do it. Well, you did so much great television, especially, it seems like, all of the Westerns. You must have appeared in... in About 40 of them. Yes, I did. And some of them, more than twice. But you you were a regular the first part of the season on Johnny Ringo that was created and produced by Aaron Spelling, one of his very first uh, shows. It was his first. How did you meet Aaron Spelling? Well, um, after I... I did, I did one little film for Ida Lupino. Remember Ida Lupino? She was a wonderful actress. She became a director, and her husband, Collier Young, were produced, produced a film called um, Mad at the World. And, um, and I was the young star in it. And every day when I go to lunch, I was always eating, eating with a crew. Uh, I'd see this guy, this little funny-looking, wide-eyed, big guy, <laughs> over in the corner by himself. And I kept thinking, why is he by himself? You know, it's not right. He must be a very lonely person. You know, it's not right. So I went over and introduced myself and said, would you like to come and have lunch with me? And he said, oh, I can't do that. You're a star. I said, that's ridiculous. I said, we're, we're all working. I don't, I, don't, I don't buy that for one minute. I said, where are you from? He said, Texas. I said, oh, me too. I'm from San Antonio, Texas, born and raised. And I said, um, and are you, you, I see you have a wedding ring. Are you married? He said, yes. I said, well, what does she do? And he said, well, she's an actress. And I said, well, great. Is she working? No. And this was Carolyn Jones uh-huh. who was married to So her. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I said, you know, I get a lot of offers, and I can't do everything. So give me your number, and when I get an offer, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll call you, get her on it. Does she have an agent? Yes. I said, oh, that's great. I said, let's get her on it. So I did that, and she did damn well, didn't she? Anyway, so <laughs> you didn't even need me, I don't think. But uh, so several years go by, and I get a call from CBS. And they said, Karen, uh, we've had a request for you to, to star in a television series. I said, are you, is it going to be a Western? <laughs> and he said, <laughs> so I said, he said, yes, yes, it's Aaron Spelling. And I said, hmm. And I said, sounds so familiar, that name. He said, well, you've met him. I said, I have. He said, this is his very first thing. He, I said, his first thing, and he's... He said, yes, you're, and he wants you. I said, he does. And he said, yes, because he said that you were so nice to him on a film that you had, were starring in, and he had a very small part, and you made him have lunch with you, and you helped his wife get work, and so he wanted to pay you back in a lovely way. I said, that's so sweet. I'm in. I'll do it. Absolutely. No, oh, Kellen. Don't prove anything. I understand. You just pack up and go. But somebody's going to die. Of course, you don't have to be around when that happens. Maybe that somebody is your friend. I guess maybe he just thought you were man enough when he gave you that badge to wear. What's the difference? Because you're going to close your eyes and there's not going to be any more killing in this whole world. Isn't that right, Cully? You go on and get out. You let Johnny face the washes alone. It was his first show. It wasn't a successful Western, I don't think. I, I did him a favor for the first year, and then I really wanted to get out of it. it. I wanted to play her as a tomboy. I didn't want to be a pretty little thing in town, you know, seeing him once in a while. I just, it's not my kind of thing. But anyway, he did all right, <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> yes, he did. You know, that was such an interesting show because Don Durant, who was the lead, had a six gun with a shotgun shell on it as well and it, this was a gimmick for the lead of the show where you'd see the bad guy they're counting shots and they never counted shots in western so he's shooting at him six times and then like james coburn gets up and goes he's out of bullets <laughs> and then the hero blows him away with a shotgun shell you know it's like so strange in that show but that's when all of the westerns had to have a gimmick Weapon. Oh, yes. Yeah. And that w- that was his. One of my favorite roles that you did is in one of my favorite shows, Gunsmoke. Oh, yeah, it's a great show. You played this 
impetuous young woman who liked to get men arguing over you oh, and man. then killing each other. Yeah, great role. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is that the sort of tomboy role you were not, looking no, for? I didn't, no, <laughs> but I love to play bad girls. They're more interesting, yeah, you know. No, that was, a, what Thank was you. it like? That was the the half hour gun smoke. I think it was in black and white. Yes, yeah. the uh -huh. best ones, I yeah, think, too. I did a couple of them I liked. John Meston uh, yes. wrote the script yes. on that, yes. too. And James, I, James Arness, I already knew. You know, that was a show that was offered to Duke Wayne, actually. Did you know that? And they put James in it instead. And... uh and he was great. I, I sometimes watch those shows on television now. I, I think Andy McLaughlin directed that episode. He did direct it, yes. Yeah. I have a great relationship I did with Andy McLaughlin, and uh, he, I'm very grateful to him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and then I did another one called Drywell, which I also like, where Burt Reynolds was kind of starting his career, and he had a, a part in it, an ongoing role. Mm -hmm. and, he was and quit. Also, yeah, that's right, he was. And so I didn't work out. They threw him down a dry well. That's it. And uh, he's he's waiting a lot of tension in that one. That's right. Yeah. Played a bad girl in that one, too. Uh, uh, well, the bad girls, I guess, oh, were the, the most best. fun. They're the best roles. Yes, exactly. I loved growing up Jock Mahoney. He was oh, the yeah. Range Rider. He was Yancey Derringer. And he was a stuntman. The most amazing thing in the episode you're in, he gets on his horse a different way each time, and you think, where, he's just like springing. His legs were giant springs. He stands next to his horse, and all of a sudden, he's on top of it. Well, he was tall, too, you know, it didn't hurt. And good looking. Oh, very good. He was a very nice man. Mm -hmm. I think I worked with him twice. Uh, and uh, he was a gentleman. You know, people always say, did you have a, did you get a chance to know people really well? Well, you're so busy working and just try to do your part. You don't get a chance to have, you know, really long relationships with a lot of the people you work with. You wish you did have time for, but you don't always. But I don't, I remember him being very lovely and very lovely to me. He, he, well, that's great to hear because he's everybody's favorite, too. Is he? Well, I'm glad. And, he deserved um, to be. He was a Tarzan later on, too. Another you could have been Tarzan <laughs> in the Jungle Girl. Well, no, we had Boy. <laughs> boy from the original Tarzan, who was a teenager at the time. And those films were really directed by Ford Beebe, mm -hmm. you know, who really was part of the animal kingdom and, and, and knew so much about animals. And it was shot in like 10 days. You know, we made 10 films days. That's a long shoot for those. <laughs> well, I thought that was pretty <laughs> quick, but it was, uh, you know. And you were on like a soundstage with jungle stock footage that you'd look well, at. Well, no, we were really in Pasadena, hmm. in some kind of. The jungles of Pasadena. Yeah, it was really in the jungles of Pasadena <laughs> in some kind of a park <laughs> thing. It was really, uh, yeah, it wasn't on sound, soundstage. Gunsmoke was on a soundstage most of the time. But well, you also worked with Clint Eastwood a couple of times on Rawhide. I did, and uh, I had a terrible crush on Eric Fleming, who played Boss. Yo, favor. And yeah, oh God, I, I had a terrible crush on him, and and so we, uh, Clint and I had the same agent. We were at William Morris, and he kept. I said, I have to work opposite Clint again. Yeah. I said. <laughs> Stupid me. Anyway, he said, "Why can't can I work with with Eric Fleming? You're too young. You got to work. Said, You're gonna work with Clint." I said, "Oh, okay." And I was so disappointed. <laughs> I don't know, but you know, he just didn't give me anything in the scene. He'd say, "I love working with you. You do all the work." But you know, <laughs> it's true. I would say, "React, react." You know, but but then it was always on the screen. So sometimes you're not sure that the other actor opposite you is doing pretty good work here. Very, I was very complaining about him all the time. Was, I was pretty stupid to complain, wasn't I? Anyway, <laughs> he was great. He was very sweet. He's still the same old Clint today. He always sees me. He's wonderful, and, and uh, he's so successful, and he's become such a great director. He surely is, yeah. yeah. The, the episode you were in, you're one of three daughters that Victor Jory has, and he's trying to marry all three of the off, daughters off. off. Yes. And, and he hooks you up with Clint. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And you were saying, where's the trail boss? Well, I tried with him, but I couldn't, get, I couldn't get him to marry me in that episode either. So anyway. You did a track down also with uh, Robert Culp. Culp. Yes, I've never have seen that. You know, at that time, and if you were working, and, and luckily a lot of us were working, and we'd sometimes not, not get home until 9 or 10 o'clock, and if a show was on at 7 or 8, you had no way of actually taping them. So you'd miss it. 
It's on Saturday mornings now. But I think right now the time that we're living in with the proliferation of all of these multiple channels, this is the golden age of television. It is. At least the golden age of classic television. Well, you know, the business has gotten to be such a huge business. Too much product. You don't get a chance to see everything. I'm a judge for the Emmys uh, several uh, minutes, several times, and I can't tell you how many box sets I get. I could fill this whole auditorium with that many, and am I going to be able to see all that? I don't know how you sustain a career like we used to, because uh, the business was the smaller business, and you got a chance to know everybody, and and you could actually be seen. Your work could be seen. Today, it's very hard to uh, to be seen because you don't the show, you know. No time to see all of that. I know you mentioned to me that uh, you're remaking or planning to remake High Noon, oh, yes, Stanley Kramer. How did you meet Stanley? Oh, this is the favorite, my favorite story to tell. Thank you for asking me. Okay. okay. Jerry Lewis had asked me to be his leading lady several times. And I said, can I be funny? No. I said, can I? No. I said, Jerry, you want me to be a straight man to you, right? He said, yes. I said, I don't want to do that. I don't know how to play those, those vacuous girls. I mean, those, I just don't know how to do that. But thank you for asking. So my father passed away unexpectedly, and I had to go back to Texas and settle the estate, and I was gone for about a year. When I came back, it's hard to get back into the business when you've been gone a year. He knew he had me. So he said, okay, I'm going to triple your salary. Edith Head will make all your clothes. It was an offer I really couldn't refuse. So I said, thank you. I'd be thrilled. Was this disorderly orderly? It's disorderly orderly. So on the next soundstage across from where we were working was a film called Ship of Fools. And every day in the Paramount, commissary, I would see this long table against the wall, and in would walk, you know, Oscar Werner, then Simone Signore, and, and, and Jose Greco, and, and Lee Marvin, and, and then would come Vivian Lee, okay? Well, I couldn't, I, I, I kept watching that table, and that was that director, I, mean, I couldn't think, what was his name? It was there. <laughs> uh, so finally, uh, I was, got enough courage to walk onto that set. Now, I've been in the business now 20-something years. I had never walked onto anybody's set. I stayed on my own set. I found it hard enough just to do what I'm doing. And I was not looking for another job because I usually had one waiting for me. But this particular time to see Vivian Lee walk, work was a thrill to me. So I walked onto that set. You know, Stanley Kramer had that ship. You know, that ship. That whole ship was on that soundstage. I have never seen anything like that in my life. And yes, she was actually in rehearsal working. And I hear this voice, who is that? And I'm thinking, I'm in the water part of the ship. I'm thinking, it's me. And that's that, um, that's that uh, director, what's his name? And I thought, I shouldn't be here. It's a close set. So somebody took pity on me. And went over and said to Mr. Kramer, that's Karen Sharp. You know, okay, okay, you can stay. Thank you, I said. I thought, <laughs> I, I, so I left, okay. So a couple of days later, I'm walking to the commissary, and that guy who saved my butt that day said, Karen, Karen. He said, why didn't you stay? Because Stanley Kramer wanted to meet you. I said, oh, that's who that guy is. <laughs> I, that's right. I said, well, why isn't this film cast? He said, well, I don't know if that's what he had in mind. I said, well, I said, oh, well, I, I don't, I don't get involved with that. You know, I don't get involved. So a couple of days later, my manager comes to visit me on the set and he says, Karen, I had a call from the Kramer office. I said, oh, is there a part in the film? He said, no, no, he wants to take you to dinner. I said, You've known me well enough to know I don't do that. I said, if he wants to see me, I will be happy to read for him over the desk, but I don't get involved with any of these people any other way. I said, you know that. He said, I do know that. A year later, Stanley's still calling. He finally says, my manager says, Karen, you take this phone call. 
because I'm tired of tap dancing. <laughs> Make an excuse for you all, every once in a while, Mr. Kramer's office calls. I said, have him call me. Mr. Kramer, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm working. I never go out when I'm working. Well, can't you throw on a pair of blue jeans? I said, Mr. Kramer, I don't wear blue jeans. I said, well, I'll, he said, I'll call you next week. I said, fine. He, so I finally thought, well, I just kept, so I said, okay. I said, I tell you what, I'm working at Republic Studios. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll meet you at the tail of the clock. I can only give you two hours. I can meet you at six o'clock. And, and he said, oh, the tail of the clock in Beverly Hills. I said, no, in the valley. It was dead <laughs> silence. He said, you, you, you live in the valley. <laughs> I said, yes, Mr. Kramer, I do. And who could blame me for not wanting to come over that hill? I said, you know, I don't need dinner that badly. And then he said, no, no, no. He said, I'll be there. So we meet in the, in, in the valley at tail of the clock. And I spend the whole dinner. Oh, six, eight o'clock, got to go. So my manager says to me two days later, how did it go? I said, okay, here's, here's how it went. I said, first of all, I'm never going to work for this man. And I'll guarantee you, none of your clients are ever going to work for this man because I was so rude because I didn't want to be there. I did you the favor. I got out. of. But I said, but I'm never going to see this man again. I end up in the hospital with an appendix. It almost bursts. It's in all the newspapers. And so guess who calls me? Guess who sends flowers? Guess who says, when you come home, can I bring you dinner? And I'm saying to myself, oh, my God, I'm going to have to do this. So I asked my friend, Henry Wilcoxon. Mm -hmm. Henry Wilcoxon, uh, you know, he was a silent screen star. He was 75 years old at the time. He was one of my dear friends. He was um, Cecil B. Mills' right-hand guy. Um, I said, Henry, can you just do me a favor and drop in and accidentally, and I'll invite you in. You'll carry the evening because I don't want to be rude. But, you know, this hurts. I, I'm just not getting, I'm still trying to get over the operation. So he said, sure. Well, he comes, they bond like crazy. Now, Henry Wilcoxon was one of the greatest chefs. I learned everything I know about cooking from him. He was great. And he made a great dinner, and they bond like crazy. This went on a couple of three times. And bring Karen, bring Karen. So I would meet Mr. Kramer at, at uh, Henry's, and I would sit there and listen to him talk. And I fell madly in love with him and married him just about three months later. And the last show I did was A Wild Wild West that had been written for me uh, opposite Carol O'Connor. I couldn't tell anybody that I was getting married because we wanted to keep it a secret from the press. But I knew that was my last line, my last scene, my last everything. And the next morning... Uh, Stanley and I went to Ventura County to get our license, and we were married at 4 o'clock that afternoon, and it hit the front page of the newspaper in spite of the fact we were keeping this a secret. And I never looked back. So that was my story. Thank you for sharing your memories. Thank you so Thank much. You. But Could be more at home on the range than the Range Rider, with his thrilling adventures of the great outdoors, his exciting experiences rivaling those of Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, Buffalo Bill, and other pioneers of this wonderful country of ours, and Dick West, All American Boy. You'll strain yourself. I said I'd ruin you the next time you ever did that. You're trying to teach you something. <laughs> well, can't you do it without spoiling a good dream? No. In this country, you've got to be on guard even when you're asleep. Oh, that's impossible. When I'm asleep, nobody can come within hearing distance of me without my knowing it. Yeah, but you're a light sleeper. I'm going to make one out of you, too. 
Another week of this water treatment, and if I just look at a canteen, you'll wake up. I'm warning you, fella. If you ever so much as... gun. Now toss down the payroll. And no funny business or we'll give you a dose of lead. I'd like to know what a man looks like when I'm fighting with him. Now get up. What do you want with me? I don't want any part of you, but the sheriff might be interested. Miss, and um, uh, uh, a couple of outlaws held up the mining company stagecoach, and, and, and my partner, the range rider, he took off after two of them, and I, I, I followed the other one. Here? I think so. But why would any bandit want to come here? Well, maybe for the same reason I'm glad I did. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, you see, Miss... When an outlaw's on a run, he, he just doesn't care where he goes. I mean, well... Anyway, I'm sure glad I'm here. <laughs> You're very kind. Um, maybe I ought to stick around and sort of protect you. Oh, well, I'm sure that won't be necessary. My brother should be back from town almost any minute. Is that all the family have? Just a little brother? 
He's a big brother. That's too bad. I mean, um, he's a big boy. Yes, he is. Well, thank you for being so considerate. If the West is ever to be made safe for law-abiding people, I know that we can depend upon men like you. Huh. Yes, I'm... Oh, you mustn't forget the Range Rider, uh, Miss... Uh, Miss... Bates. Bonnie Bates. And don't worry. I won't forget him. <laughs> but what would he think of me if he knew I was detaining you for more important things? Dolly, right now I don't care what he thinks. <laughs> You're sweet. You're awfully sweet. Oh, well, bye, Miss Bates. Goodbye, Mr. West, and, and thank you again for everything. I won't forget it. Neither will I. Goodbye. Goodbye. He almost caught me. I barely had time to get back into this dress. Who is he? Never mind about him. It's his friend, the Range Rider, we've got to worry about. Where's Kane? He got caught. He what? Don't worry, he won't talk. You don't think so? Why do you suppose our old man's in jail today? Let's not go into that. Because he didn't use his head, that's why. He trusted too many people. Well, I'm not making the same mistake. Well, I'll tell you, Sheriff, the one that gave the orders is just a kid. If you're sure, I'll round up a posse right away. There's one man that you won't have to round up, Sheriff. Range Rider, Judd was just telling me that you saw it happen. Recognize him, Judd? Well, I... I can't rightly say for sure. Put it on. Put it on. Recognize him now? Gosh, I don't know. It all happened so quick like I... I wouldn't want to be wrong. All right, Range Rider, you're so smart. Get yourself out of this one. I'm still holding you 24 hours just in case. In case of what? In case we stay unlucky and have to release you. Come on, inside. I'm sorry I couldn't be any more help to you, Range Rider. My eyes ain't what they used to be. Forget it, Judd. Forget it. What do you think we ought to do now, Range Rider? Oh, he's stalling, Sheriff. You know his kind as well as I do. Here's his gun. Two shots were fired. I'm afraid that's still no proof. Hi. What'd you find out? Nothing. The guy I was trailing gave me the slip. Where about? Oh, out there at that cute little gal's ranch. What cute little gal? Oh, her name's Bonnie. Bonnie Bates. Oh, I, you'd like her, compadre. She's... I know. She's different. That's what I was going to say. Every petticoat you meet is different. Oh, lay off me, will you? you? You think I was a crook or something. Hey, that gives me an idea. What's on your mind, Range Rider? The man you just put in jail, Sheriff, has never seen Dickie. So what? So they say it takes a crook to catch a crook. How'd you like to trade places with one of the Sheriff's wallflowers? Uh-uh. Every time you get ideas like that, I get different ideas. Thanks anyway. Lock him up, Sheriff. This is a notorious panhandle kid. What? Oh, no. See you later. Ah, hold it. Now, let me tell you about yourself. You're a notorious panhandle kid, and you're from McKinney, Texas. Hmm? You've got a reputation for being one of the fastest gun slicks in the Southwest. I am? You've got about nine notches on your gun. I am? You've made about four jailbreaks. Yeah? Now, don't forget, you're supposed to be a rough, tough hombre. <clears throat> I am. 
All right, all right. Take your paws off of me. All right, shut up and keep moving. Go on. If you weren't hiding behind that gun, I'd... Shut up I'd... and get over there. Now get in there till you cool off, Mr. Panhandle Kid. Who's he? What's it to you? Well, so long, boys. When you get ready to talk, I'll be right outside. No good, Star Packer. Locking me in this crummy jail for robbing a two-bit stage. Me, the panhandled kid. Now, ain't that a laugh? What's so funny about it? Nothing, pal. Only just don't be surprised if I ain't hanging around for breakfast tomorrow morning. Want to make any bets? Yeah, I'll make you a bet. I'll bet you all the money you made on that holdup. What holdup? I heard him gassing about it out in the office. Now, you still want to bet? You talk big. Let's see the color of your dough. Oh, don't worry. I got mine stashed away. Plenty of it. And there's lots more where it came from. Like I said before, you talk big. Well, what you think don't worry me, because I'm getting out of here. How are you going to manage that? What do you care? You ain't leaving. Oh, I might be talked into change my mind. Well, who said I asked you to? Two's better than one. Yeah? Why'd be at that? I thought you'd come around seeing it my way. Now, what's your plan? Well, now, it might be a little rough on you, but if you're still game, here's what I got figured out. Okay, let's make this look good. My turn! Oh. So if you don't want to hear it, just take it real easy and stand in the corner. You shouldn't have done that. You might have killed him. Come on, let's get out of here. Sheriff, you all right? If this was the way we planned it. Hey, that's you? Yeah, I'm here. For. You got us out now. I'll take you in. Whose place is this? You take the horse and put him in that barn over there. I'll tell my partners we're here. Honey. Honey. It's me, Kane. Where are you? It's about time. Where's Harp? Harp? How should I know? What do you mean, how should you know? I sent him to get you out. If that wasn't my brother I heard right up with you, who was it? Panhandle Kid, why? Who? Panhandle Kid. We made the break together. You brought a stranger here. Take it easy, Bonnie. Take it easy. This Panhandle Kid's plenty tough. The law even thinks he bosses this outfit. 
Listen, there's only one boss of this outfit, and you're looking at her. Where is he? He's outside waiting to meet you. Send him in. Yeah. You got a surprise coming to you, kid. Go on inside. I'll water the horses. Gainchester. You. So it was your brother I trailed here. You made quite a chump out of me, didn't you? Please. Don't say that, Dick. I know what you must think of me. But if you suddenly found out that your own flesh and blood was wanted by the law, well, what else can a sister do but try to protect him? <laughs> Dick, you don't know what I've been through since this morning. I can't blame you for wanting to protect your brother, but... Well, it'll make it a lot easier on him if you'll tell me where he is. I don't know, Dick. Please believe me. I'd like to believe you, Bonnie, but... What's a gun for, kid? To use if I have to. Who is this, anyway? You. You got my brother into this. I told him not to trust you. Let's take a look around. Go on, let's go this way. What's going on? Never mind. Just stay in front of me. Go on, move. <laughs> Go ahead, lock him up in the other room. He's out of the way till we can get out of here. Come on. You go ahead. I'll wait for Harper. He's not worth it, Bonnie. You know it. He's still my brother. All right. In that case, I'll take mine now. I had it ready for you. Here. Where's the rest of it? Get out. <laughs> You're tough, Bonnie. But not that tough. I mean what I said, King. Get out. Money. Let go of her. What's this all about? Never mind that now. Just lock him up in the other room with the panhandle kid. Who? The range rider's pal. They call me the Range Rider. And I'm after two men that escaped from jail and their partner. I heard some shots coming from this direction. So, uh, you thought they came from here? Is that it? Oh, I thought they might have. Well, in that case, I'm afraid you've guessed wrong. As you can see, I'm quite alone. Well, as you can see, so am I. I'm sorry if I frightened you. Well, it sounds as though all of a sudden you have guessed. Excuse me.
I have a feeling you're about to be jilted, Romeo, so you better check on your girlfriend. Yes, sir. your hat. No, sir. I'll never trust another petticoat as long as I live. You must admit that Bonnie was different. Excuse me a minute, Dickie. Please allow me to help you, ma'am. You're very kind. Packages can be awful bundles sometimes. This little boy is angling for an introduction. The only trouble is that he's allergic to petticoats. Some men are awful flirts. They certainly are. 